Good morning again, everyone from a very sunny Canberra. And good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the first Australians from whose traditional lands I speak today and pay my respects to elders past and present. My name is Tony Erskine and I'm director of the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the Australian National University and chair of the 2020 Oceanic Conference on International Studies. Welcome to our Distinguished Scholars Roundtable, The Significance of 2020, International Relations in a Time of Crisis. 2020 has been a challenging and tragic and often overwhelming year. In Canberra, I clearly remember New Year's Eve 2019, having to cut short a dinner outside with family because thick smoke rolled in during the evening after weeks of intermittent smoke from the huge fires that were burning out of control. Everything looked alien and eerie, and it was impossible to breathe properly if you went outside. At home, we somberly welcomed the new year, and I saw images of families on the television taking refuge in the ocean in New South Wales to avoid fires that were destroying sections of towns. In early January, the university here was initially closed briefly, less than one day after it reopened for 2020 because of the smoke hazard. Around the same time, we had the hottest day on record in Canberra. It was 44 degrees centigrade. That's 111.2 degrees Fahrenheit for my American colleagues on the panel. Many of us spent time working from home in January to avoid going outside um, because of the hazardous smoke. Many of our colleagues with homes outside Canberra were evacuated multiple times, and we have friends who lost their homes. At the end of January, I stood by the lake in Canberra and could see flames and smoke appro approaching. It was terrifying. I didn't sleep that night. People wore masks to go outside on the worst days. I bought a large box of face masks for my family in January. And when the smoke finally subsided the following month and the fires started going out, I innocently wondered when I would ever use all of these remaining face masks. I didn't yet understand 2020. Over 30 people died in the Australian bushfires this year. A huge, huge area of land was scorched and nearly three billion animals were killed or displaced. There's more that I could say about our 2020 here at ANU, but without going into all of the details, let me note that we also had a freak weather event in January that caused millions of dollars of damage to campus buildings and destroyed most of our cars. We referred then to the 2020 apocalypse before we knew that we were also going to be affected by a pandemic. March brought the reality of a global pandemic and a lockdown, and we all went home again to work. But our 2020 has been easier than many other places. Well, it's always easier for most of us here than many other places. And we've looked outside Australia to see political turmoil and tension and protests and riots alongside rapidly rising death rates from COVID-19. And 2020 has seemed to me like it would never end. Time slowed down painfully, yet the year raced recklessly on. And here we are coming to the end of 2020. What have all of these aspects of 2020 meant for international politics? And what will this year of crisis mean 10 or 20 years in the future when we look back on it? To answer this question, I've asked a panel of distinguished scholars, brilliant thinkers and creative minds to join me to try to answer it. I have here with me Nita Crawford, Professor and Chair of Political Science at Boston University, Stephen Miller, Director of the International Security Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, Cynthia Enlow, Research Professor at Clark University in Massachusetts, Amitav Acharya, Distinguished Professor and the UNESCO Chair in Transnational Challenges and Governance in the School of International Service at American University, 
I'm Sarah Davies, Professor of International Relations at Griffith University here in Australia and an adjunct fellow at the Gender, Peace and Security Center at Monash University. So whether one focuses on the climate change that has felt so real to us here in Australia, political upheaval in the US, tensions with China, growing populism in various parts of the world, COVID-19 with its very different impact on different countries and also different groups within those countries, or another aspect of what has been a truly catastrophic year, what has 2020 meant and what will it mean for international politics? Each panelist is going to take 10 minutes to address this question, and then we'll take questions from you in the audience. If you please type your questions in the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and I'll also try to call on people um, to ask their questions, but if you could type them, that would be fantastic. Nita Crawford, may I start with you, please? Nita. Well, thanks for having me. I was actually hoping to be with you at this meeting and um, that is another meeting. I'm sorry I can't be there. Um, but nevertheless, I have a few things to say about what this year has meant. And I want to focus on a, a couple of things. First, climate change is patently, obviously underway. As Tony's just described it, we can see that the planet is on fire. In fact, we may be at a tipping point for action, political action that's uh, more intense and um, likely to yield concrete results than 2015, than the point when we got to the Paris Climate Accords. So uh, with Brazil, Australia, California on fire, climate refugees is the name that we call these people who are displaced when their homes are burned with a record number of tropical storms and hurricanes with emissions having slowed, but still uh, at a rapid pace growing um, with um, uh, the declining world economy, we still see too many emissions. And we've got COVID and other diseases like Ebola and Zika, which are zoonotic, meaning that they're coming from uh, animals that uh, we're coming more into contact with because of climate change and environmental crises. So we see the intersection of crises um, so if the, the planet is on fire, uh, politics in response is on fire in a sense. It's both the great unraveling and the great turning. And those aren't my phrases. They come from the observers of climate change politics. The great unraveling is the, is the discussion about, you know, how thing, everything's going to hell in a handbasket because of climate change. The great turning is the political, cultural response to that. And in particular, we see it um, most concretely in things like eco-villages and transition towns, which are uh, working to change cities and how they are making them more sustainable. Um, and then we also see uh, cities and states building sustainability and other institutions building sustainability into their planning. So sustainability is becoming institutionalized. That's, we've, we've moved to a tipping point there. So in other words, people are not waiting for national governments. They're going, in fact, beyond national governments. And at the same time, what we're seeing is a decentralization of certain kinds of power. So literally, electrical power is being decentralized. And I think that this has implications for political power. As countries, regions, people get uh, uh, the capacity through renewable energy to produce their own electricity, they're not dependent on the same chains of supply and relationships. This may have implications for a, a shift um, in political power that will play out over um, you know, the, the lifetime, at least of my child. Okay, and this also brings me to my second point, which is climate justice is, is on our lips. In, in other words, the North emitted the lion's share of emissions so that they could develop, but the the black and brown people of the world will pay the price in two ways, not having the capacity to have those emissions, and secondly, um, having the least capability to deal with the disruptions caused by climate change, which brings me to the second point about um, race and racism at the forefront of our consciousness in 2020. Uh, I don't have to tell you about Black Lives Matter. You've seen it on the streets. 
It does raise the questions of the militarization of policing, and it illustrates this white populist backlash against black and brown people. So we're at this moment of progress and backlash. Uh, so the violence is disproportionately directed at people of color, indigenous people, and women in this militarized moment. The third point is a sort of glass half empty, glass half full observation about democracy. For the last decade or so, I think we've seen uh, very clearly what political scientists like to call democratic erosion or democratic backsliding. And we used to think that this is only happening in sort of marginal places like Belarus or Romania, you know, newly democratized places, they may backslide. Well, we saw backsliding in the United States and um, it's been very disturbing and patent. But what's really interesting uh, to me is the response to the backsliding has been from the grassroots and you saw it in the 2020 elections with the movement to protect the vote and pr protect a possible power grab by President Trump, uh, his unwillingness to cede power. And all of this sort of grassroots organizing was in the background, sort of ready, nascent, uh, uh, so that if needed, people would be ready to take to the streets. Um, I, this is a great, the dog that didn't bark though, at least not yet. And then finally, I wanna say something about the United States appearing to withdraw from Afghanistan and Iraq and about militarism and uh, sort of a larger um, moment that we're in. 2020 brings us, in a sense, back to the status quo anti-Trump with the election of Joe Biden in the United States. And I don't want to say too much about his foreign policy other than to say that um, with the selection of the new, uh, potentially new Secretary of Defense, what we seem to be getting in uh, the Pentagon and likely in the State Department, we'll see this as well, the, the sort of politics that we had with Obama, which are you know, very familiar American um, leadership, multilateralism. But what we won't get is probably what we need the most, which is a fundamental rethinking of the role of war in US foreign policy and the role of the military. Um, so the wars did great damage to lives infrastructure, forced displacement, and it's certainly a cost in dollars and opportunity cost for the United States and its allies. The, the long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were not successful. They weren't cheap, they weren't controllable, they weren't quick or effective. All the promises that we were made in 2001 and 2003. But none of that, I think, will be questioned um, going forward if the same faces are there in the next administration that we've seen before. We don't, in the United States anyway, the largest uh, military power in the world, seem ready to be able to rethink the Pentagon's legacy and its missions abroad. And in particular, we're, we seem ready to go back to, um, or to continue the pivot that the Bush administration made in 2000, in 2000 I'm sorry, 2001 for China, but wasn't able to complete, and that uh, Obama tried the pivot towards uh, China. But I think we'll do it under a Biden administration, and that's probably not good news um, for either um, U.S. military spending, which is likely to rent the same or get higher, or in terms of greenhouse, Pentagon greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm bringing you back full circle to climate change. The Pentagon is the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter in terms of an institution, okay? There is no other institution in the world that emits more greenhouse gas. Its emissions are on par with Sweden or Portugal or Morocco, entire countries in, in any one year. Unless and until the Pentagon reduces its emissions and, ha and rethinks its mission of protecting Persian Gulf oil, uh, we're, we're, it's gonna be very hard for the US to make a, a transition and to uh, reduce military spending and um, to put its energies where I think they need to be, which is the world's largest threat, which is climate change. So I'm done. Hopefully on time. Yeah, thank you. There's so much there that I want to come back to. Um, the planet is on fire. Politics is on fire. But we'll, we'll come back to points. I want to now turn over to Stephen Miller. Steve.
Thanks, Tony. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Very much wish I was uh, with you there in, in Canberra. Uh, we were given license to uh, pick uh, some slice of 20, the 2020 experience to spend our 10 minutes uh, on. And uh, as I think this panel will display, uh, there are a lot of things that might be talked about and many perspectives from which to talk about them. Uh, I chose to focus on one uh, obvious, but I think very consequential recent development, which is uh, the election of Joe Biden. Uh, so the American election as one of the big uh, stories of, of 2020. Uh, and I chose this simply because I think it has huge implications both for American foreign policy uh, and for international politics uh, more generally. And the reason uh, this seems particularly consequential, at least to me, is obviously because President Trump had pursued a number of lines, a number of policies that dramatically diverge from traditional American policies and, and inclinations. Uh, and he foisted an incomplete, but nevertheless pretty dramatic revolution in American foreign policy, Trump did. And I think that what we're going to see in Biden is an effort to reverse or undo the Trump revolution in US foreign policy. Uh, so what are the implications of that? Uh, I have uh, nine points in nine minutes, so I'm going to give you uh, uh, a series of headlines, but these are ways in which I think the results of the American election are going to have a large imprint on the world in which uh, we all uh, live in the coming uh, uh, five to 10 years. Uh, first, uh, we're going to see a profound change in the domestic and international management of the COVID-19 uh, challenge. Uh, we're going to move from denial and absentia uh, to uh, confronting the science and trying to act collaboratively uh, to uh, fight the, the virus. And even though we seem to have entered the vaccine phase of this pandemic, I think this is a change that could touch hundreds of thousands, if not, not millions of lives in the months to come. Secondly, we're going to see a 180 degree reversal on the issue of climate change, which my friend and former student, uh, Nita Crawford, has just identified as the world's most urgent uh, problem. And we're going to proceed from uh, flat denial of the science and complete rejection of the international diplomacy of climate change to a reconnection, at least, to the issue in some sort of a reasonable way. Uh, thirdly, uh, Biden, I believe, will abandon Trump's assault on the global trading system, which though it had been largely an American creation, Trump regarded it as an uh, unfair uh, uh, arrangement that disadvantaged uh, the United States. Uh, uh, this idea that uh, the institution should be spurned and uh, trade wars should be launched because they're, they're easy to win. I think that uh, proposition is a thing of the past. Uh, fourth, I believe that uh, Biden will reject Trump's extreme distaste for multilateral diplomacy and international agreements. There's a long litany here, which I assume this it, it, it audience is familiar with, uh, ranging from the contempt for the G20 to the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement to rejection of the Trans-Pacific Partnership to the withdrawal from the World Health Organization. And those are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think that uh, Biden will try to reverse or undo much of that. Certainly he will engage with the world in a different and I think more uh, congenial way from the perspective of much, much of the world. Fifth, uh, Trump essentially uh, repudiated or ignored America's traditional commitment to democracy promotion and human rights. This was a central strand of most presidential foreign policies, uh, whether you're talking about Reagan or or Carter, or you know, remember that Bill Clinton's foreign policy white paper was called the Strategy of Democratic Enlargement. Go look at uh, George W. Bush's second inaugural and so on. Uh, this has been uh, an important part of the values component of American foreign policy, and it's simply been missing in action in the last 
uh, four years, uh, I think it will be restored to a much more prominent place. And this will have large implications for American relations with uh, countries like China and Russia, but also countries like uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, where a blind eye has been turned to some pretty unfortunate developments. Uh, sixth, uh, I think uh, Biden will reverse Trump's uh, rejection of arms control. The Trump administration has done a near total demolition, demolition <laughs> on arms control. There's very little left. Uh, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the, the uh, Iran nuclear deal is a poster child for this, but the failure to extend the New START agreement with Russia is another. Biden still has just enough time to salvage the New START agreement. But I think what we will see is a reconnection to arms control as a possibly useful instrument of American foreign policy, as opposed to a, an unadulterated negative that needs to be disposed of. Seventh, uh, Trump was absolutely unique in the post-World War II history of American foreign policy in his dislike for and disregard of America's allies. Uh, they were regarded as a problem, a burden, a, a nuisance, uh, and as inadequate, uh, insufficient partners uh, around the world. Uh, and I think with the arrival of Biden, we're going to see the allies restored to something like a more traditional position. So we're going to move from allies as burden to allies as core asset. Eighth, uh, I think Biden will not share Trump's rather remarkable taste for non-allied, non-democratic uh, leaders. Uh, he couldn't stand Angela Merkel and, and uh, people like that. Uh, on the other hand, he had great affection for uh, Putin and uh, seemed to regard himself as having a distinctive friendship with Xi Jinping uh, and had tight relations with Erdogan and Mohammed bin Salman and even a bizarre bromance with Kim Jong-un, right? Uh, and so we had this uh, instinct under Trump to sort of coddle the dictators and bash our friends. I think that that dynamic is going to uh, disappear and that has large implications for our relations with a number of important uh, countries. Uh, lastly, um, on the question of immigration, uh, this is the ninth uh, point. There are others I could have listed, but I'll limit myself to these. Uh, the United States has cracked down on, on legal immigration, it's cracked down on illegal immigration, and it's cracked down on the admission of refugees. And this has affected hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. It's affected students and scholars, it's affected uh, desperate people fleeing oppression, uh, We've had this year record low admission of refugees in the United States. The humanitarian dimension of American uh, immigration policy has almost disappeared. I think this is going to change under Biden. This is one area where he can have a big mark quickly, and that will affect uh, large numbers of, of people around the world and uh, the ability of lots of people to move around and come to the United States. So, so to conclude, uh, Trump, I think. Uh, when you look in retrospect, launched a remarkable number of what you might call reversals of American uh, policy. There are always lots of disagreements within traditional American policy, but they tended to have a certain instinctual line, which Trump in many respects rejected. And uh, my po point has been that in, in a number of these rather significant respects, Biden will try to, to, re to undo this Trump revolution. And one of the fateful questions of the coming uh, period will be how reversible is Trump's impact? Uh, and it is obvious, of course, that many of the policies that uh, he put into place can be restored to previous settings. But it's also true that a lot of damage has been done. There's been missed opportunities. Climate change, I think, is one of them where we've basically squandered another four years that were not easily squandered. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, which was working pretty well, uh, was completely derailed and we'll never know uh, what the possible benefits of, of an undamaged uh, JCPOA might be. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, broken crockery that, that possibly can't 
be re repaired in part because of intentional efforts by the Trump administration to make things difficult to reverse. For example, a lot of the treaties that have been formally abandoned, that is where there's been a legal process of withdrawal, uh, re renewal of those arrangements will require Senate ratification, which is unlikely to be forthcoming uh, as long as the Republicans have 40 or more votes in the US Senate. Uh, you can see in recent weeks, uh, efforts to maximize uh, the damage done by some of Trump's policies, for example, with the maximum pressure policy on, on Iran, trying to leave as sour of a relationship as possible for the Bidens, uh, Biden folks. Uh, or with respect to the Open Skies Agreement, uh, which the United States has now formally withdrawn from, hard to imagine a more innocuous agreement and one that was valued by many of our allies. So why this one became a victim is not entirely clear other than a theological uh, opposition to arms control. But President Trump issued an executive order calling for the destruction of the aircraft that implemented uh, the American portion of open skies, which had as no other purpose than to uh, make it difficult to restore the American position. And then my final point, because I'm now to the end of my time, uh, is uh, there, we have to be mindful, I think, of the reputational effects on views of America uh, created by the last four years, because the restoration of America's position in the world to something more akin to a pre-Trump standing depends not only on what the United States does, but on how others view and respond to the United States. And I don't know how those of you who are out in the wider world watching what's going on in Washington and in America can look at us today and see the same state, the same country that you thought existed four or five uh, years ago. How can the United States look the same in the eyes of the world after this? And it's not simply what's been done, but the fact that, that the entire population watch this act for the last four years, witness these policies, heard day after day on the news, these various impulses, the bashing of NATO, the trashing of our Asian allies, and et cetera, et cetera. And in the recent election, 75 million Americans were fine with it. Doesn't this say something about the constancy with which the United States can operate in the world? Uh, when you know that half the country is fine with a set of policies which are so at variance with what people, what the world in a sense has come to expect of the United States. Uh, and I'll close uh, by, by uh, plagiarizing the title of a, an article that a friend of mine, Tom Nichols at the Naval War College wrote the day after the election. Uh, you can find it actually in the Atlantic uh, magazine. And the title is, Half the country prefers the sociopath. Steve, thank you very much on the election of Joe Biden and the likely forthcoming and welcome reversal of Trump's own various and damaging reversals. That was great, thank you. I'll turn over to Cynthia and Lo now. Cynthia. Hi everybody, it's lovely to be here. I know it's very, very hot up in Brisbane, so I'm not so sure I wanna be with Sarah in Brisbane. Um, but maybe, maybe Melbourne's a little cooler, right? Maybe. Um, but I, I just wanted to say how delighted I am to be here. And I really wanted to think about this being the Oceanic um, Association, that um, it, it's very tempting, I think, in international politics analysis, or maybe in political science generally, um, but maybe particularly in in international politics um, to kind of deplace ourselves as if we are kind of in a, some fantastical no place, as if that is every place. Um, not people on this fine group don't do that, but there is a, there is a tendency to float way above the planet. Um, and so I want to start with Shamina uh, Ali. Shamima Ali is um, the director of the Women's Crisis Center in Suva in Fiji. 
and to get my head around uh, this session and the big agenda that um, Tony has set for us. Um, I wanted to listen to Shamima Ali uh, being interviewed on the Australian Broadcasting Company's um, site uh, when she was given an award. And she was asked about domestic violence and other forms of violence and abuse against women by men in Fiji, a country that, as she makes clear, has, within recent memory, had three military coups, has had um, serious um, uh, weather catastrophes, um, which underscore uh, Nita's point about having to be able to think about climate change if we're going to think about uh, international politics, its causalities, its possibilities. And Shamina made several points that really struck me. The first thing was the ABC, um, that's the Australian Broadcasting Company, um, the ABC interviewer um, asked if the hashtag Me Too global movement um, had affected her work. And she said, well, now remember, Fijian women have been organizing against um, patriarchal abuse uh, and violence for years. Yes, the hashtag Me Too movement has given us extra legitimacy and extra uh, energy, but we were organizing before that global uh, movement had a hashtag. The other thing she said is, um, we've had to try and continue organizing uh, when uh, social service budgets have been cut across the board in Fiji. Um, and she also said she was very diplomatic because there she is in Suva, having to do the work she does. And this raises the point that Nita also made about militarism. Um, she has to continue to do this work um, against violence against women perpetrated by men um, in the midst of a very militarized uh, political life in Fiji. And finally, she made clear that Fiji is undergoing uh, climate change extreme weather, um, which of course endangers both women and men, but it also reshapes the relationships between women and men. And we know this um, back from the first tsunami that was so-called named, that um, when w extreme weather happens, whether it be fires or earthquakes um, or um, cyclones or monsoons or hurricanes, that those reshape, and not always favorably, the relationships between women and men wherever they happen. Uh, climate change is not ungendered. Military coups are not ungendered. Service cuts to budgets in the face of economic crises, which we're all now facing because of the pandemic, are not ungendered. And I began to really try and think through, I, I, we're all teachers. Um, I worry that I'm not equipping students I work with, and like all of you, I work with students in a lot of different countries, um, I worry I'm not equipping them with the right, with the useful skills. And I'm even worried, well, basically, not even, basically I'm also worried that I don't even know what the skills are. If there's something that has really been a theme throughout the COVID pandemic is about the politics of care. And the politics of care is not something that most political scientists have a clue how to talk about, not to mention teach and analyze. Um, and yet it has come up as the constant urgent theme day after day. Every time you read the newspaper or listen to um, a report from India or from um, Congo or from Mississippi, you are forced to think about, which is a good thing, care. And care inside domestic spaces, care 
that states don't know how to organize or refuse to organize and what that means internationally. And I, I find myself really trying to make better gender sense of what care means, what does it mean when it's withdrawn, and I try to watch the various very energized pro-democracy movements now in Belarus, in Poland, in Hong Kong, um, and make sense of how care is affecting their politics. So that Polish women, for instance, who are amongst the driving forces now against the anti-democratic uh, pop, so-called populist, not really populist, um, uh, regressive um, autocratic movements um, in Eastern Europe. Um, and if you listen to the activists, many of whom are women and many of the organizations are women-led, they do not separate care from civic life. And they do not separate the EU and international organization from care, from civic life. And if they don't separate it, we shouldn't separate it. We somehow has to, have to come to grips, I think, with what we're teaching and what maybe we don't know how to teach. I mean, part of the problem is the old uh, story about if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you only have a hammer, you only can see nails. Um, whereas if we turn it around and imagine, so what don't we have in our toolkit? What sorts of analytical skills? I'm talking about causality. What kinds of analytical skills so that we can track causality do we not have in our toolkits? Maybe because we haven't been interdisciplinarily trained. Maybe it's because we don't have enough feminist colleagues to push us to be interdisciplinary. Maybe because international relations people don't talk enough with comparative politics people. Um, there are all kinds of reasons, but I think, and this really underscores, I think, the theme for all five of us here today, and that is the urgency of the question that um, Tony has posed for us. 2020, is it, will it be a turning point? And it can only be a turning point if we, our responsibility, is to gain new skills that we don't now have and share those skills so that people coming along will have the skills to talk about the relationships between violence, I'm talking about causal relationships, between violence, social movements, climate change, militarism, and public health. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've never studied the WHO. I never even imagined that how the WHO has been hamstrung, where its money comes from, how dependent it is on certain donors, affected its relationship with Beijing to try and unravel the Wuhan origins of COVID. I mean, I was at a loss. Nobody ever suggested I should know how the international politics of public health works. Luckily, I, I'm in the same town as both Steve and Nita. Luckily, I've got actual friends who are epidemiologists. And when we get together over Zoom or in somebody's backyard when it was warmer, I actually say to my friends, Julie, who's an epidemiologist, um, I say, so Julie, and then I ask her these questions that I realize I don't have any clues about. So I'm really, I guess I would like all of us who are, I see there are 86 people taking part in this session. I would like all of us to put our heads together and think, what kind of skills do we need? What kinds of skills are we not getting? What would those skills look like? And how do we have to change our ways of making sense of international politics so that we can create skills and share skills to meet the urgency of 2020. Thanks. That's great, Cynthia, thank you. 
There are so many vital questions there from what do we miss if we don't investigate the international gendered politics in this time of crisis. You said climate is not ungendered. Financial economic crises are not ungendered. You talked about the politics of care. care. What does care mean? What does it mean when it's withdrawn? Will 2020 be a turning point? And what skills do we need to make sense of this time of crisis? There's a lot to think about, and we'll come back to that in the discussion period. Now I'll turn to Amitav Acharya. Amitav, over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this panel. It's really nice to see my co-panelists. Uh, we don't see this, uh, we don't participate in these conferences for some time, so it's really good to be um, at a multinational conference, even online. So I'm going to talk about uh, the topics that I have been following. That doesn't mean that these are the most important developments of 2020. So I have been following a couple of uh, issues very closely uh, for several years, but uh, certainly since the outbreak of the pandemic. And uh, some of that also relates to uh, the U.S. elections and foreign policy. And uh, there, Steve has pretty much said, uh, uh, and I completely agree with all his points, except one that I'll come back to. Maybe I take a different view. But uh, uh, let me make my major, major argument. Um, I don't think 2020 is uh, a game changer in the sense that we didn't know some of this are not coming. I consider 2020 as an accelerator rather than creator of these changes. There are many, uh, many of the developments we saw in 2020. Uh, we had seen warning signs of that. And uh, of course, I'm not going to talk about Bill Gates who apparently had predicted that uh, 10 years ago that, uh, uh, that there's going to be a pandemic and the world is not going to be prepared for it. But we did have uh, warning signs of pandemic. And, uh, and uh, people who are studying international relations and security have uh, uh, warned that uh, transnational challenges, climate change, pandemics, and other, uh, including terrorism in a transnational sense, are going to be far more important than uh, conventional conflicts. Uh, uh, so um, I wrote an article in 2016 in National Interest where I said the major challenge to the United States is not coming from other powers, or rising powers, but for rising threats, including the pandemic. Um, but again, I do not know uh, COVID-19 will take on this sort of uh, scale and seriousness. But still, I think it's fair to say, uh, in my view, that many of the changes we have seen, many of the shocks, uh, are not necessarily from 2020. And uh, the, the one change that I am going to focus on is uh, at the very broad level of a world order, how this is uh, 2020 is affecting world order. And this is where my point that uh, 2020 is an accelerator uh, uh, comes through. So first of all, um, I think 2020 has uh, finally put paid to any hope that we are going to see a uh, kind of preservation or revival of the liberal international order. And this is a term that has been debated much. Um, and uh, you know, <laughs> the decline of the liberal order has nothing to do with 2020 per se, it started with Trump. And in, in my case, it started much earlier, a uh, decade before that, maybe 2008. And uh, um, what, has, what 2020 do, did was the, the end of denial uh, among uh, especially some liberal uh, thinkers, liberal internationalists, that the liberal order is not coming back, uh, who had kind of kept hoping that uh, somehow Trump is uh, going to be uh, a short-term uh, phenomenon and thus the liberal order will come back. Uh, but I think uh, they have also started uh, because of the, not just because of what Trump did, but because of other changes that happened in 2020. That they said maybe this is uh, not going to come back. Uh, the end of denial that liberal order is uh, in a mortal crisis. Now, there are two other, two changes that have nothing to do with Trump per se, although a little bit, but uh, which happened in 2020 that makes uh, reviving the liberal order very difficult, including by Biden. Although I do agree with Steve that he would be very different when it comes to allies and multilateral institutions. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the globalization, the backlash against globalization, which was already there. That's how Trump got into office. 
this is much bi uh, bigger now. Uh, and because uh, the way the borders were closed, the globalization is supposed to be a borderless world and borders were the first thing to close uh, <clears throat> and uh, after COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak. Uh, the disruption of supply chains, again, that was happening because of uh, Trump's trade war, but uh, certainly th this time it was not Trump because the COVID-19 also created a lot of disruption in supply chains and also created the fear of supply chains that, uh, that uh, uh, the countries uh, may be, uh, not become too dependent on global supply chains, become a little more self-reliant. Uh, and, th and this has been talked about not only in the US by Trump supporters, but also in the European Union, which is supposed to be a paragon of uh, liberal uh, internationalism. Uh, also uh, blaming, uh, with, rightly so, uh, travel and tourism. Uh, how did COVID-19 spread? Um, mainly because of travel and tourism, which was a link to globalization, but also it was kind of a phenomenon itself. And this is where I don't actually think it's a bad thing that uh, tourism has been affected. Because tourism was a very powerful cause of climate uh, destruction, really. And I, even though I don't travel uh, for the last year, um, but I actually think this may be one of the good things that come out of it. That people will be more careful and about uh, traveling uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and also tourism and the, therefore it might mitigate its effects on uh, environment and also heritage uh, sites. Uh, Another thing that uh, 2020 did was institutions. Again, institutions were already undermined by, uh, uh, well, it Trump's policies, but institutions were also fragmenting. Global governance was already fragmenting for quite some time, uh, including WTO, WHO, UN system. They're all, they're no longer the only game in town. They're being challenged by, uh, joined by other types of uh, cooperation network, networks, public-private partnerships, especially in climate change, and also regional-based uh, uh, cooperation, regionally-based cooperation. Uh, and uh, in the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, institutions severely underperformed. Uh, you know, and uh, I know that the U.S. pulled out of WHO, but the WHO was underperforming for quite some time. And, uh, and look at the entire U.N. system. Uh, you know, there is... Uh, don't want to blame them too much, but certainly they did not live up to anybody's expectations. So because of that, uh, 2020 uh, was a year in which some of the trends that were already happening become much more severe and serious. And the, uh, considering that uh, globalization and institutions are the two of the core basis of the liberal international order, they damaged it even further, which was already damaged by Trump and even even before that, because of the structural changes in the global system, including the rise of other powers. Moving on then uh, also, that uh, 2020 showed us, this, this is my second major point, that the world doesn't love either of the big powers. Neither the United States nor China did a great job uh, to inspire confidence. The idea of a, not only G2, but the idea of a great power management of international order uh, uh, was basically totally discredited. And I want to go into the details of Chinese lack of transparency, uh, uh, suppression of information in the beginning when COVID uh, virus uh, <clears throat> broke out in Wuhan and, uh, and this denial conspiracy theories. Then of course Trump, which initially embraced Xi Jinping as his friend and China has done a great job. And then uh, talking about the China virus, but also what United States did to manage this virus, control the virus at home. Uh, discredited U.S. image in a way that will be uh, very difficult to come back. And this is, again, I agree with Steve on that point. So, so the world is not looking at either the U.S. or the uh, China as, uh, it's not either or, it's like a bit like, you know, a pox on both your houses. But uh, at the same time, the emerging powers, the BRICS also did not do very well. I mean, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, they're all been severely infected, I mean, affected by COVID economically and also in terms of health, and they haven't really been able to control. Uh, China actually did so later on after the initial missteps, but the rest of the BRICS uh, did not. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the whole narrative about emerging powers comes to this. Not very well, I would think. Moving on to another dimension, which is uh, human rights and democracy. I think uh, while the great powers 
of the big powers did not come out very well, uh, the kind of countries that look attractive now to many people are the small and medium countries, uh, South Korea, uh, New Zealand, uh, you know, uh, and, and Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and, uh, and Australia, of course, not a small country, but small population. Um, I think what has, this has done is that uh, it has shown that what matters in international relations or world order building is not power, not size, uh, but uh, uh, a population, but governance. And the one reason why Asia did, the uh, Asian countries did la la relatively better because they, they managed the, the pandemic very well. They learned the lessons of 2003, SARS outbreak. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, then I think uh, Cynthia made the point about politics of care. I wanted to emphasize the importance of human security, which basically to me is the politics of care. And uh, see, more people have died in the pandemic than most wars. So when we are going to learn uh, how to think of security in the broad sense, security of the uh, person and health security uh, uh, is one of the key elements of the human security paradigm. So that is going to be reinforced. So finally then, uh, to sum this up, I think 2020 is going to uh, accelerate some of the changes that are already happening. It's going to take us away from the Western dominated liberal international order, for better or for worse. I think Asia might come out better than the West, ultimately, not economically, but in terms of also uh, politically. Uh, President Biden will certainly revive American prestige uh, because of the sheer force of his personality, but he's not going to bring back the pre-2008, uh, pre-Obama liberal international order, uh, pre-Trump international order. The world would be more decentered, more post-hegemonic, and uh, uh, more pluralistic. Again, that was already happening. How international relations scholars take to that? I think uh, you know the world is changing. I don't think the field of international relations is changing very much. So I'm a little pessimistic uh, uh, when Cynthia said we need new skills, and new ideas. So it will be all, all very nice, but the way we train our students, the, our graduate students, with the, uh, and the way we conduct research uh, has a kind of a longevity uh, uh, that uh, is not going to be so easily challenged. But still. Uh, Let's keep hoping. And one of the good things that have come out, apart from tourism uh, being uh, sort of uh, not killed off, but it will come back, but certainly people are understand the dangers of tourism and travel now. Uh, but I think, uh, I think the, the anti-racism riots, which is not linked to COVID, I think it's a very good thing. Uh, because it, for the first time, I've seen so much interest in racism and race and international relations that I hadn't seen before. Um, you know, I myself have been inundated. I'm, I don't do this, uh, race. That's not one of my subjects. But I've seen so many requests to give talks on race and racism in a way that would have been impossible without the anti-racist racist riots in the United States. And, and it has had a transnational effect. And I think that may be one of the best things to come out of 2020. Thank you. Amitav, thank you. That was fantastic. So on how 2020 is affecting the world order, um, I was intrigued by your idea of 2020 being an accelerator, that 2020 is a year in which trends that were already present are becoming more serious, the end of denial, um, and also your statement that Asia might come out of 2020 um, better than the West. There's a lot to come back to. Thanks, Amitav. Um, finally, we turn to Sarah Davies, and I'd like to note that in 2019, Sarah published an excellent book called Containing Contagion, the Politics of Disease Outbreaks in Southeast Asia, which I think is the most astonishing example of either research serendipity or incredible foresight that I think I've come across in academia. Sarah, I'll turn over to you. Thank you so much. Or it's one of those things where once it's out, you wish you could bring it back because a year later, there's so much you'd like to change. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. I wish to acknowledge the people of the land of the Ugarabal, Yugara, Jagara, Turabal, Uganda, and Kumbaberi peoples on whose land my Griffith University operates and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I would also like to thank uh, Tony Erskine and her colleagues at ANU for putting together an outstanding OSIS during such a tumultuous year of bushfires and, and the pandemic. It was recently argued in a piece published in an online supplemental issue on COVID-19 in international organisations that while the aftershocks of COVID-19 will be real, the pandemic's lasting effects may be minimal. 
if one examines the distribution of power and the distribution of interest, the effects of COVID-19 may mildly reinforce the status quo. There was an attachment of addendums and caveats to that. In similar articles, though, what struck me in the issue made those similar points. The political patterns may end up being quite ordinary despite the pandemic being extraordinary. And what it struck me was that if COVID-19 has not shifted the status quo, as a discipline, it should surely be the opportunity for us to understand better what may be wrong with the status quo before the next emergency, as has been so eloquently talked about already. And what has struck me personally is that there's been so many contradictions in what I've observed this year in the area of cooperation and human rights. And I think we actually need to spend more time trying to unravel and understand what we have observed this year. And there are three areas that I'd like to briefly single out. First, there's the paradox of international cooperation itself. There's so much fixation on what did not work this year, the delay of the UN Security Council to address COVID. But the underlying question here is, why did we think it would have made a difference? The threat that Trump posed to the World Health Organization, the organization with the withdrawal of US membership. But there's a stark realization that UN agencies and organizations like the World Health Organization have for a long time been fragilely dependent on funding, particularly from the United States, despite the competing ambitions of other emerging great powers. There's been less focus on, in terms of international level cooperation, the adaptive learning we've seen this year as the world has scrambled to respond. And I'd like to talk about two briefly. One example was travel restrictions. The treaty which guides the World Health Organization Director General to declare COVID-19 a public health emergency on the 30th of January, also called for states not to implement travel and trade restrictions unless advised to do so. Yet 70 countries within the space of, of the days went on to implement restrictions after the declaration. And China itself imposed a lockdown, travel restrictions within its own territory. And this act no doubt saved the country from a massive crisis. Countries including my own in New Zealand also imposed travel restrictions that no doubt contributed to some of our success in deviating sharply uh, in, in, in flattening the curve. But this was a deviation from the advice that the WHO Director General gave. So how do we make sense of constructive non-cooperation? Another example is scientific cooperation and information sharing from the perspective of looking at past emergencies. Virus sharing and prompt reporting requires very delicate cooperation between politics, politicians, bureaucrats and scientists. And for me, what's really captured my attention so much this year has been the example of Thailand, the second country in January, to not only report the COVID-19 case that they had arrived, but to openly publish a decoded genome of the virus. It's really fascinating to actually listen to the scientists who argued for this and made the case to their government that there had to be this prompt open sharing of the virus genome, which is why we were all able to develop PCR testing so quickly it probably has contributed to why we may be looking at hopefully having at least nine vaccines in effect by the end of this year. There have been ugly resourcing fights that ensued concerning PPE, testing materials, treatments, and now I think we will see those fights with vaccines. But I think it's really worth us finding and reflecting on those moments of cooperation and sharing, such as the one in January 2020 in Thailand. Would this have happened in other locations where a novel virus could emerge? And what were the underlying features that enabled that moment of remarkable transparency? Second, the crisis has given rise to serious questions about human rights, as we've heard already. There have been egregious violations of human rights during COVID-19. The use of emergency powers and lockdowns have removed potentially the right to abortion in what, at least one country, the right to protest in a number of countries. There is a violation now of privacy through biosecurity contact tracing methods that may continue to be used after the pandemic is over. Quarantine of people who have been tested positive with the virus, military imposed brutality on individuals who are impoverished, ethnic minorities of political opponents, the public shaming of individuals who didn't wear a mask or didn't close their shop in time, and the neglect of individuals during lockdown, those in crowded living conditions, working in informal job sectors, the disabled, elderly, and a failure to understand across a large number of countries that the home is not a safe place for people at risk of domestic violence. 
the challenge to restrictions on movement have been primarily presented as through an economic lens or that brutal public health Malthusian lens. From a human rights perspective, it's actually been really difficult to challenge the lockdown, I think, due to the overriding public health imperative. But I think it is clear that we need to consider the consequence of these restrictions and the harm that it has sometimes created for those who have already been restricted in their daily lives due to physical, social, economic, political, and religious marginality. We know COVID restrictions have exacerbated inequalities in many parts of the world, and I sincerely worry about the way in which we're gonna roll out the, uh, the vaccine, the way in which we're going to link it to ID and identity and who may need be neglected and not be able to access the vaccine because of these prior conditions of inequality that they're living in. The human rights dimension has also been recognized more in this case though than in previous emergencies. And that's the contradiction here. When I look at SARS, H1N1, Ebola in West Africa, and even Zika, it was often very difficult during those moments of emergency to really bring to light, as Cynthia eloquently talks about, the politics of care that had to be focused on in those emergencies. The pandemic has revealed on a global stage the injustice being lived by those who experienced those previous outbreaks. They lived those injustices that we've seen now. They had to live in, in moments where there wasn't the same level of attention and recognition of what they endured. We've seen in 2020 the unequal division of care roles, the harmful practices of informal and low wage labour and the compromises on health due to crowded living conditions. The fact that we still have nearly a billion people right now that don't have access to water and sanitation in their homes places them at much higher risk of not only COVID-19, but a vast number of other diseases as well. The pandemic finally has raised questions about the way in which we as a discipline go about doing our research and sharing our ideas. And I'd like to suggest that we could reflect on whether we want to return to the status quo in our own discipline. Zoom has broken down some of the barriers to access, but there are many people who cannot access our talk today because they don't have secure, safe, affordable internet. It's revealed the pace of global travel that we maintained, but it came at a considerable cost to the climate. Should we revert to the status quo in our own discipline, or is now the challenge for us to try and find a new way of doing our work? We've also been confronted with very difficult questions about how to do field work, what methods to use and how to collaborate more effectively and more inclusively. Can these practices that we've tried to use in 2020 may emerge more in a less ad hoc fashion going forward? The vaccine will bring back a new normal. Many may want to stop seeing the unequal conditions that favours the wealthy. They may be desperate just to get back to any kind of normal. Human rights violations are already we're increasing through information sieges or cleverly blocked points of order on a security or human rights council. This too will quietly continue. And we may congratulate ourselves for our ingenuity in creating a vaccine in record time without remembering the quiet acts of international cooperation that led to this moment, such as in Thailand in January this year, when politicians listened to the scientific experts in that room and that genome was placed out for open access so that everyone could see what was coming. The status of international order may or may not shift, but I think it's really important that we study the paradoxes, the harmful effects, and the moments of quiet international cooperation that overcame the status quo. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. There are some really important provocations there. If the pandemic doesn't shift the status quo, you said, it should give Austin International Studies the opportunity to investigate what's wrong with the status quo. And you brought in acknowledging the prior conditions of inequality as well. Those are very important. I've got a number of questions that have come in in the Q&A. Um, just to remind people, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, that would be fantastic. I'm going to go to the first three questions, I think, after these fantastic presentations by the panel, and then give the panelists an opportunity to respond to those questions. But also, I think they'd like the opportunity to respond to each other as well. So I'm going to take the first three questions. Um, I'm going to start in just a moment with James Blackwell. If I could ask the people, we won't be able to see you, but we'll be able to hear you, I hope. So if you could please introduce yourself, say who you are and where you're based, that would be fantastic. So if we could start with James Blackwell. James. Hi, thanks, Tony. Um, I'm a research fellow at the University of 
New South Wales, but uh, live uh, out of ANU here, here at the Bell School. They're kind enough to give me a home. Um, my question is, is for Netta, uh, do you think it's dangerous for Biden to be reinforcing this kind of Trump precedent regarding naming a, another four-star general as Secretary of Defence? Uh, you know, obviously we had matters in 2017, we now have General Austin in 2020. And do you think we can, or how do you think we can sort of unring that bell if General Austin is eventually confirmed? How do we kind of go back to a more civilian-led uh, Department of Defence going forward? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, James. The next person, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Primitivo Ragandari. If you could ask your question, please, if we can get you. Yes, I see you on the screen. Could you ask your question and introduce yourself as well, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Prime. I am now here in the Philippines. Um, my question is for um, Cynthia and Sarah. Um, Cynthia, I am really moved with what you said about the politics of care. Um, can you please speak a little bit more about this, especially more in the academic context? And then, um, thank you so much. And then for Sarah, interesting thoughts, Sarah. Indeed, the pandemic crystallizes human rights and other issues, which didn't occur during the outbreak of Ebola, SARS, and etc. Do you think this crystallization happened because it is worldwide and compared to SARS or Ebola, which occurred largely in the global south only? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the final question for this round is Kath Jones. Kath, could you ask your question if we can get you up as well, please? Kath, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Kath Jones from St Andrews in uh, wet and cold Scotland. Um, uh, my question was basically to everybody. Um, and it's partly because I'm an optimist. Um, but thinking about the role of experts, expertise in 2020, one of the things that was very pronounced to me this year was for the first time in a very long time, experts seem to have come back to the forefront in supposedly guiding policy. Whether that's just a misnomer in terms of the presentation of different governments um, rather than a substantive engagement with different forms of expertise. But does the pandemic actually give us a chance to go back to and reconsider the way expertise is, is incorporated into policy communities, whether that's within international institutions in a liberal world order, how, whether it's how we consider the role of scientists in informing climate debates, whether it's in terms of the people who get marginalized in debates. Um, is there actually a moment to say expertise should be coming back, but maybe it should be coming back in a different way to, to how we've understood it in the past? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kath. Um, I just want to reflect for a moment that I know that we can't be here in person, but I think it's wonderful that we've just had three questions from people on three different continents. I'm going to go in reverse order to the panelists and again to respond to those questions and or respond to your fellow panelists. Sarah, I'll start with you, please. Thank you so much for those questions. Uh, Primitivo and Kath, I think, were the, my two questions. So I think that there's been there's a lot of discussion actually at the moment about why human rights has come to the fore so much more quickly in the case of COVID-19, though I'm conscious of the fact that there are others who have argued it, it hasn't come quickly enough. And I think that that is part of the, the paradox that we've seen here that I was, there's been a lot of discussions about the fact that the initial groups of experts were primarily brought together to discuss the the way in which the FIC should be declared and then the way in which individual level countries should manage the, the lockdowns or the procedures. Human rights seems to be something that sort of came trickled in rather than it came in sometimes because there were stark sort of evidence of it being neglected. But I also would point to in my own area, like the gender and COVID-19 working group, we came together quite quickly in February to discuss and talk about how COVID-19 needed to have, you know, a feminist informed response. And I think that came because of what we had observed was lacking and missing in terms of our own networks and collaboration uh, during the previous outbreaks that we had been witnessing. And there's been a lot of agitation this year to try and demand for that. So I think it's partly because 
there has been this shared experience and that has enabled this. Um, but I also think as well, and there has been a lot of, I think, fair criticism that maybe it's been neglected in previous outbreaks because it wasn't something that a lot of us maybe were witnessing and observing and experiencing. So we didn't pay attention to it in the way that we could and should have done until we, were, uh, we ourselves were, you know, experiencing compromised care roles and other sorts of, of you know, complications due to COVID-19. In terms of the role of expertise in 2020, I think that comes that somewhat related to the previous question actually about who gets to be the expert in response to COVID-19 and who gets to be listened to. And I certainly would argue that while we have seen the emergence of the expert, we have also seen a lot of damage being done, deliberate attempts to undermine experts this year as well, you know, and to associate them with being, you know, questionable, um, linking them to infodemics. So I would argue that Perhaps that's the one area that I think we need to be paying a little bit more, a lot more study on is, is, is how expertise is understood and how it is framed and who gets to decide who is the expert and the politics of, of receiving expertise. And then as well, the, how the public thinks about and frames expertise. And perhaps too, and this is something that Heidi Larson has talked about a lot in the case of vaccines, that maybe one of the problems with expertise is that it tends to not want to have conversations around the unknowns and to listen to minority voices who are pushing back. And maybe that's an area as well that expertise needs to engage with much more, which is you know, being able to actually recognize and listen to valid questions around what experts are telling them and to recognize the impact that it's going to have on individual lives if they just listen to the experts. Thank you. That's great, Sarah. Thank you very much. Amitav, we'll move to you next. Yeah, I just want to respond to one question, and that's about expertise, uh, since uh, some of my research is about expertise and the communities. Actually, honestly, I don't see expertise coming back, having come back in 2020. I see conspiracy theories coming back. I see uh, politics of uh, knowledge coming back. Uh, maybe it looks different in Europe, in the UK, but if you look at the United States, just think of Dr. Atlas, I mean, Trump's advisor, the last uh, health advisor. Uh, so we see a lot more conspiracy theories. Uh, the whole mismanagement by Trump of the COVID-19 that killed hundreds of thousands of Americans that could have been avoided is because he did not listen to experts. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, he berated them, even Dr. Fauci, who is a uh, well liked by a lot of people. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful about uh, how expertise is uh, politicized in COVID, and, and in, uh, not only just about uh, the vaccine, but overall how to handle a pandemic, what I mean, implications. Conspiracy theories abound. It's not just the US. The Chinese uh, government also put forward a conspiracy theory that uh, the virus came through US military deployment to uh, a military games in uh, Wuhan. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, this is, I think Trump is having a, a effect on other parts of the world. But having said that, I wish there would be more um, respect for expertise. And I think uh, uh, President Biden has already started doing that, uh, President-elect Biden. And I think he's going to listen to more to experts. Maybe, maybe that will be a, a bit of a change. Great, thank you very much, Amitav. Um, and just to say to the audience that I am going to try to take a couple more questions after we go through the panelists, if we have time. I'll move on to Cynthia. Cynthia. Hi. Um, let me uh, start with um, Kath, um, because we're all talking about this. Not surprisingly, you know, we are academics, so you know, uh, we all uh, get some of our legitimacy that s from somebody thinking that we know something about something. <laughs> Not always, but um, and and I'd just like to. There's a there was a a moment, and Sarah, I bet you saw this. Um, there was a letter signed by 38, I believe, epidemiologists, women epidemiologists. Do you see the letter, Sarah? And and they published it in the Times Higher Ed, the T H E, the Times Higher Ed, um, uh, the publication out of London, out of the Times of London, but it's called the Times Higher Ed Supplement. And they, that's where they published the letter. And you can go to it. I wish I could give you the actual, what they call their letter, but it's by, I believe, 38 signed uh, women epidemiologists who said that what they saw happening 
was that in fact they were their knowledge from their specialized um, long-term um, uh, research experience was being pushed aside um, on and that a disproportionate number of people who are being asked to be the talking heads you have to measure this somehow um, uh, that they were um, men and that that women as epidemiologists with particular knowledge uh, were not being treated as if they had authority. And I think that letter is a real wake up call and reminds us what Sandra Harding and many others have said that, you know, that knowledge is um, political. It doesn't mean that therefore there is no more reliable evidence than non-reliable evidence. This comes back to Amitav. That that doesn't mean that we, you know, throw in the towel and think, oh, you, everybody's an expert. That's not true. Um, but I thought their letter really is a good uh, caveat, a good warning about uh, patriarchy and expertise. Uh, and because that then accords authority and um, authority is at the heart of how patriarchy sustains itself, even under new conditions. To Prem in the Philippines, you, of course, uh, being in the Philippines, but being a, um, a researcher, my guess, is in the Philippines, you know that one of the most striking things about uh, Filipinas, that is women from the Philippines, is the percentage of um, international nurses, um, uh, migrant, that is nurses who emigrate to other countries, um, come from the Philippines. Um, and there are a lot of healthcare systems in the world, New York City amongst them, that would really collapse if it weren't for migrant uh, nurses from the Philippines. So care, care is so often feminized. And, and if you can feminize something in a patriarchy, which is all our countries, some more than others, but there's no non-patriarchal society on the planet today, um, if you can feminize something, you can underpay it and not treat it as having authority. So one of the things, and Tony has seen me talk about this a little bit, is I've become interested in something I know very little about, but historically about um, the politics of nurses and nursing in war, and I would say in other crises. And so I think that one of the problems and it's easier it's easier to talk about it as human security because then you get to use the word security and if you get to use the word security you kind of can be in the masculinized arena a little bit even if you're kind of opening some of the doors in the arena but care care sounds like something that women do for no pay or low pay and it's harder to be taken seriously if you are really trying to take seriously the politics of care. And in a lot of countries, uh, the politics the, of unpaid care, especially of children when schools are closed, and the amount of stress the number of women who have quit or cut back their hours of paid work so that they can take care of their children's education when that education is going on if, as Sarah says, you're lucky enough to have a uh, Zoom connection. So I think I'm gonna stick to the politics of care um, because I think it's more disruptive, it's more kind of riskier for IR types. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Cynthia. Um, we'll move to Steve Miller. Steve, please. I'll limit myself to just one uh, quick comment, especially in view of the time. Uh, on this question of expertise, this is an issue that has uh, caught some traction here in the United States among people who who follow policy and politics. Uh, I'd refer you coincidentally to, again, to my friend Tom Nichols, who has a book called The Death of Expertise, uh, but also Dan Dresner at Tufts University, who's written 
uh, a book called The Ideas Industry. Uh, both of these have to do with how uh, the uh, inf national information systems get, get polluted, uh, the national discourse gets uh, deformed by uh, multiple uninformed uh, voices. Uh, in the United States, we have now a situation where you have coexisting uh, separate uh, multiple information ecosystems and people live often in their own little uh, information bubble. And some of these bubbles are fact-free, science-less, conspiracy-oriented, uh, and hyper-ideological. And uh, when those kinds of forces gain traction, you end up seeing the kind of phenomena we've been seeing in the United States. Uh, I, I uh, at the level of personal anecdote, witness this on a minute scale because my father spends most of his waking hours watching Fox News. Uh, and the simple way to put it is simply that he lives in an alternative universe. And uh, the reality that he sees is not the reality that uh, I in any way sense or perceive. So uh, this whole question of expertise, what is it, how is it deployed? When, where, how, why should it be uh, deferred to or, or respected? These turn out, I think, to be really critical questions. And uh, much of what's gone awry in the United States, I think, has to do with the fact that people no longer believe in facts. They no longer believe in science. They no longer believe there's such a thing as actual truth. Uh, and it, you simply deploy whatever narrative is most convenient to your own interests. Uh, that's how much of our politics works these days. Thank you, Steve. Nita. Well, I'm going to put together two questions, um, the question about expertise and the one about General Austin, in the sense that General Austin is an expert in the deployment of force. And that's why he's been chosen to be the next Secretary of Defense by President Lloyd Biden. So he's the kind of expert, though, that um, I think doesn't help us think outside the box in a moment when we might, might need somebody to be uh, much more creative. And um, I think the issue of uh, that as it was playing itself out in the last few weeks was whether Biden would select a woman or a person of color, probably a black man. Okay, so it's women versus black people, black men. And thankfully, the discourse has moved to the question of whether or not this particular general is too close to having left the Pentagon. I think that's a more interesting debate about civil military relations. And it, it gets us to the question of you know, what kinds of interest do people have when and how they become experts? Which moves me to the second thing I want to talk about, which is Cynthia's very provocative question of uh, what are the skills we need? What do we need to teach? And I think this goes again to epistemology, like how do we know an expert when we see one and, and whose perspectives are valued. So um, I, I believe that there are real things in the world, but how we know those real things um, is important, how we train people to know those real things. Like most of my um, graduate education, sadly, um, was about levels of analysis and um, agents and structures. And I think all of that's valuable, but um, a, a feminist perspective gives you a different set of agents than the dominant one. And those are valuable to um, see and know. And uh, it's not simply agents and structures, it's processes. And Amitav talked about processes, governance processes and the strength of those. So when we think about educating um, the, the next crop, um, you know, I'm wondering, if, Cynthia, if, Really, what we need is this, the Korean parada, uh, uh, proverb, knows the way, stop seeing. You know, knows the way, stop seeing. How can we teach our students to be uh, fresh, to come at problems with fresh eyes, and to listen to things like uh, the ethic of care, even though that isn't in the dominant paradigm of security? What would that mean, uh, an ethic of care or politics of care? 
So um, anyway, I'll stop there. There's so much more. But I'll be uh, yeah. Thank you, Nita. That's wonderful. Um, and, and wonderful timing. Actually, we're at 1029. So we've just about come to an end. Um, there, I know there are a lot of other questions that people wanted to raise, but actually looking at the questions, I think we have managed with the panel to touch on most of the themes that are being brought up. So I will close. I want to thank the audience for your great questions and for being part of this this morning. Um, I know this is a webinar format, so it doesn't allow for audible applause, but I know that you'll join me in thanking our very distinguished panel um, for their insightful and sophisticated and provocative reflections on the importance and the impact of 2020. Um, after a short break, we'll be back for the 11 a.m. sessions. Um, thank you very much, everyone.